Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Paxson. I'd like to welcome all of you here today. Uh, this is the fourth lecture in the Presidential Colloquium series, Thinking Out Loud, Deciphering Mysteries of Our World and Beyond. Uh, today, we're delighted to have with, uh, with us Professor Jim Gates, a distinguished university professor, university regents professor, and John H. Toll Professor of Physics at the University of Maryland. Uh, he will be introduced uh, formally by, by Professor Chris Rose, uh, but I'll just give a brief description. Uh, today, we will be listening to Dr. Gates today as he asks, what guards our reality against oblivion? And his answers may lead some to wonder whether we are living in the matrix. Uh, Brown is a history of asking big questions. Uh, this lecture series featuring renowned scientists like Dr. Gates provides accessible public talks on big public topics. Uh, for those of you who haven't been to others in the series, and I really want to thank Chris Rose for all he did to organize this really tremendous series, uh, we were honored to welcome professors John Johnson, Emery Brown, and Paula Hammond to Brown. Uh, they asked big questions from are we alone to what is consciousness, and discuss killing cancer less tox toxically through very artful nano uh, engineering and nanotechnology. Uh, so next month, we have, we have the fifth in the series, and I would encourage all of you to come. Uh, Richard Tapia, renowned for bringing math to life, uh, will be our final speakers in the series. Uh, he'll talk about math at high speed, I am told particularly bicycle and drag racing. So it sounds like a very exciting talk, and I hope you will come. Uh, and again, I, I think it's great to have this series where we bring science uh, to audiences that actually blend scientists and non-scientists. Uh, the talks I've seen, heard so far have been tremendous, and I'm really looking forward to this one. So I will turn the program over to Chris Rose, a uh, visiting professor of engineering, who will introduce Professor Gates. I'm just the intro guy. <laughs> These are the ones that have done all the work. Uh, so thanks, uh, Chris, for and Brown for you know hosting this series. It couldn't have been done without uh, Brown's support, and in particular the president's office's support. It was, it's been fantastic. It's been unlike any other seminar series. It's not really a seminar; it really is a big deal colloquium series that I've ever run. So thank you very much, Brown. Thank you especially, Chris and Larry, where this is kind of based, and Jim. And is Bjorn here? Where did Bjorn go? Are you hiding Bjorn? No, oh, you tell him he's a sponsor. Bjorn better come. Um, in any case, so I want to tell you a little bit about Jim. Uh, I've known Jim for it's 40 years. He, he keeps on. He does the four finger thing, and it's like, oh my goodness. So you know, he's a little. He's a little bit older than me, but not much. Um, we were at MIT together, and so he was always a role model. But I wanted to tell you, uh, rather than look at the program, and with all of our speakers, you know, you can just look at the program, and it's a little frightening um, how accomplished the folks that, are come, that have come in are. So I don't want to talk about that, you know, all of that, the PCAST membership, the National Medal of Science, you know, all of that frightening stuff. I want to start, and I think this is actually Jim's clicker, with um, to... The thing about Jim is that he's just so accessible and such a wonderful guy, and that's why he's a role model. He's affected at least a generation of MIT students, and now uh, at uh, UMD, where he's been for years, uh, he's affected on even a larger number of students. So, do I have to turn this on, Jim? Is this yours? Okay, so help! I gotta... <laughs> You're an engineer, Chris. Yeah, the, yeah, but you know what that means. <laughs> I'm a theorist. Uh, you know, it is terrible when a theorist... <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> but it is terrible when a theorist... Yeah, you know, this is... <laughs> yeah, this is... Yeah, well, you know, like I said, if I could turn red, I would. Um, but this is Jim. Um, so this is a budding phys physicist. Um, I think you're probably about... Looks about eight or nine. Is that about right? And Jim already knew that he wanted to be a physicist way back when. Um, he saw a movie. Those, that, uh, those of you that were at the, um, there was a little luncheon that, was, that we held for Jim today that uh, some of you came to. 
um, he always knew this is what he wanted to do. He wanted to be a scientist and study physics. So, you know, that's the early gym. Um, that's the gym I knew. Um, and that's actually very tame. Um, you know, <laughs> those of you who know that particular era, I won't say exactly which year, um, you know, the pants are solid. Um, we'll leave it at that. But, uh, you know, Jim, at front of the board in sunglasses and an Applejack, um, you know, is, is, uh, that was the gym that we knew. And he taught, as I said, a number of students. He was a tutor. Uh, he ran uh, or was a physics professor uh, for a summer program at MIT. And that's the gym that we uh, kind of grew up with. So, you know, the next gym, and he's easily, you can pick him out easily there. Um, and uh, there's somebody else that's rather famous uh, there. I think Jim was a postdoc at the time, and uh, either at Caltech or at Harvard. Uh, he was at Harvard. And, um, you know, so the pedigree is all there. He's a theoretical physicist. And, you know, then he became a professor, uh, first at MIT and then at UMD, where he's been uh, forever, and with a sojourn at Howard for a little bit. So that's the usual normal sort of stuff, except for the fact that he was an incredible teacher, an incredible uh, person all around. Um, well, he's also the president's physicist. He sits on one of the, uh, the, the president's advisory council on science and technology. And, you know, there he is, sitting there. And there's a number of these sorts of pictures, and it's really kind of cool. Um, he's also a public physicist. So he's been on NOVA, you know, any number of times. Uh, his most recent appearance was really cool. It was the Big Bang, uh, the Big Bang Machine, and that aired in January. And there's especially, on this particular segment, there's these 30-second spots where he explains string theory <laughs> in literally 30 seconds. And, you know, it's, it's, um, and the funny thing is, I know just enough string theory to know that he's not actually just blowing smoke. He's actually explaining it. So it's pretty funny. Um, and he's also a lauded physicist. So uh, a couple of years back, um, he received the National Medal of Science. And, you know, you'll wonder why uh, President Obama is laughing. Well, they, they had an exchange. I, I won't describe. Now, I saw the uh, YouTube video of it. And there were certain things that I'd say were dog whistles to me. It's like, hmm, something is going on between these two guys that we can't really hear. Um, so I, I don't know what they said. But, you know, the point is that they had some sort of relationship and something happened. Um, and that's the end of that particular exchange. <laughs> And, and I guess this is, I, I'm going to stop with this uh, slide because this is really uh, the gym, a playfulness that he's always had. You know, he's a string theorist. That string theory is kind of, in, or has been, kind of inaccessible. Jim is actually now making it accessible. And I don't mean just in the Nova sense. I mean in the work that he's actually doing. So with that, I want to introduce my uh, friend. And I also have to say... Slightly different thinking, you know, every speaker here has been just a little crazy, okay? So, Jim, you know, take it away. Well, let's see. Uh, first of all, thank you for that kind introduction. It was mercifully short, which we are very happy about. I can't tell you the number of times that... Um, I've had other experiences with introductions. In fact, I speak quite frequently uh, all across the country and all across the world. And because I receive so many uh, speak, uh, invitations to speak, we've created this document that we send uh, to our host so that they can make an introduction. Now, the document contains everything that you might dream of saying, but it's always sent with the instruction of Pick only a few things that would be of interest to your audience and just say those. And I can't tell you the number of times when uh, I've been sitting in a space much like this and the person who's doing the introduction apparently didn't get the message. And they try to read through the entire thing. And so on one occasion when this uh, was occurring, I had a friend who was sitting right next to me and he leaned over at some point after some ridiculously long recitation. And he said, you know, Jim, um, we've all heard of a man who needs no introduction. I said, yeah, that's, that's right. And he said, but you know, that's an introduction that needs no man. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that literally happened to me. 
uh, with regard to this picture with the president, um, uh, so there's a story about that. Uh, uh, I, I told the president a joke, and if you actually look, it's all on YouTube, and if you look at it, you'll see that I lean over and I whisper uh, something into his ear. And it's a joke I especially crafted for him. I spent a couple of months actually thinking about this joke. <laughs> and uh, boy, did he enjoy it. In fact, he enjoyed it so much that he frightened me. And as a consequence, uh, like I said, you just go look at the YouTube video. You, you'll see him. In fact, the press in the back of the room were wondering what, what it was much like Chris said. The press, we could hear buzz from the press corps in the back of the room wondering, what in the world is going on up there? And we, of course, never explained it. And, and so uh, during our Q&A today, let me just say, don't ask me what the joke was. Okay, so let me try to begin the presentation. So what guards our reality against oblivion? Well, that may seem like a rather strange question to ask because after all, seeing, you know, there's this statement about reality being rock solid, right? You've heard that expression before. And so for most people, this is question is kind of a non-starter. So, oh, you know, Reality's fixed. Why do you worry about such things? But for people like me, and I'm going to take you on a little tour today of modern physics, this is actually a real question. And so by the end of the talk, I will hope to have explained this. So first of all, let me start with my uncle. And you can see him there with his glorious white hair. Uh, he was the man of the year for, uh, a man of the century, actually, for Time Magazine uh, some time ago. And uh, he gave us a, just a marvelous gift. And let me uh, also emphasize that we are one year short of 100 years of his greatest scientific work, a theory called general relativity. Uh, it was delivered in final form in 1916. And in next year, there will be celebrations all around the world about the construction of general relativity. So he told us basically how to understand our place in the universe. It's from his work that the idea of the Big Bang came. It's a, actually, a, it's actually a, an equation and the solution to an equation. Um, the expanding universe, all of this is Einstein's great legacy to our species. Um, so our universe is a very interesting place. It has four major forces. Gravity is the first one, and that's why I started with Einstein. The strong interaction is a form of nuclear energy. It's the reason, in fact, the sun shines. Um, but there's something very interesting about the um, sun. It turns out that if you take two protons and glue them together, put them in close proximity and let them glue together, and then try to take them apart, it's actually possible to do that scientifically. But if you put three protons together and then try to take three apart, it's actually harder to take three apart than it is to take two apart. And you put four protons together and let them just glue themselves, because there's a, the strong force does that. And you try to take the four protons apart, it's actually harder to take the four than to take the three. And so, in fact, this simple fact explains why the sun burns. Because you see, what the sun is doing is it's taking basically assemblages of protons. And it's because it's a very, uh, very energetic place, protons bump into each other. And then sometimes they glue together. And so when you get two of them gluing together, that's actually uh, uh, more stable. I'm sorry, when you get three to gluing together, it's more than stable than two. And so in fact, the reason the sun burns protons is because it's trying to get to the most stable form of collections of protons. Very simple thing to understand. You don't need to be a rocket scientist or a nuclear physicist to understand that explanation. But that's literally why the sun burns. And now, in this uh, picture here, this is a very famous graph that shows how much energy it takes to pull the protons apart after you put them together. And as you can see, it, it starts increasing, increasing, increasing. And what that tells you is that the sun or any star will operate in such a way that it's going to try to increase the number of protons per unit volume that are glued together. Until it gets to the top of, whoops. Just a second here. Until it gets to the top of this curve, you'll notice it turns over. It turns over at iron. Because if you take more than the number of protons that, are, that make an iron nucleus and put one more proton in, and then ask, is it easier or harder to put it, to pull it back in the other? It's actually easier. And the more that you glue in after iron, it gets easier and easier. And so, in fact, our universe has this 
process of creating the elements, the elements that we're all composed of, except that there are elements of here that are actually important for biological systems. And so the question for some time was, where do these things come from? Because it's not the stability of the star that's creating these objects. And it turns out that the elements beyond iron are all created in supernovae explosions. This is the source of the, of the one, to my mind, one of the most beautiful and prosaic statements about the way our universe works. The statement was made by Carl Sagan. He said, you are made of star stuff. And he, it's literally true that some of the molecules in your body, which are out here, had to be created when stars explode. So it's literally true that if stars didn't explode, you couldn't be here. That's a connection to the universe that to me is, as I said, I think this is one of the most beautiful statements I've ever heard about science, that we are literally connected to stars in this way. So, if I can get my star to explode, here it is. This is where, part, where some of your parts list came from, explosions like this. This is an animation of uh, Eta Carinae, which was a very actually unusual supernova explosion. Okay. So, now you know something about how you got here. Stars had to explode. Just think of it. To set the stage for your existence, stars had to actually explode. How, how cool is that, right? Think about it. I'm here because a star exploded. I'm a star, right? I mean, that's what it leads to. <laughs> so it's a, it's, it's a strange relation, but it's scientifically valid that we are related to stars in this way. So let me tell you some more about our universe. Um, in addition to nuclear energy, there's also electromagnetic force. Well, gee, we're really happy about that because that's where Wi-Fi comes from. Without the electromagnetic force, we wouldn't have all these nice Wi-Fi devices and the apps that they run. Um, but back in the end of the 1800s, people noticed something very interesting. Remember when we were far out on the curve there? I said it doesn't take more energy to pull a proton apart. Well, if you stop and think about that, that means if you start very far out of out in that arm of the chart, then protons, and in particular, nuclear matter, should fall apart because it becomes more stable by getting rid of protons. That's, in fact, the source of natural radioactivity, which was discovered at the end of the 18th century by Becquerel and Curie and folks like that. So, how does, so now you start to think, okay, I've got this bag with lots and lots of protons in it. And it's beyond this point of stability, so it wants to get rid of them. So this bag, which is an atomic nucleus, has several modes for doing this. One thing that it can do is actually spit out protons in pairs. Pairs of protons are actually helium nuclei. And so, in fact, this is what we call the alpha ray uh, decay mode of nuclear matter. It spits out pairs of protons. The two protons are pairs, they're bound together, because remember, that's a very stable configuration. So it simply spits them out, and it tries to get rid of them as many as possible. So that's one way that you can induce number of protons. Another way, it turns out that um, inside of nuclear matter, in addition to protons, there are neutrons. And neutrons are actually shapeshifters, if you watch them very carefully. A neutron has the possibility of changing itself from a neutron into a proton, because the neutron, by the way, weighs slightly more than the proton. And therefore, again, this idea of going to lowest state works here. And so a neutron changes to a proton, but now that doesn't balance. A neutron has no charge. So if it just changed into a proton, then there would be imbalance in charge. Charge would not be conserved. So when it changes into a proton, it also creates an electron. That balances off the charge equation, one positive charge, one negative charge but it also spits out a third particle, which we call a neutrino. And so that's another way to get rid of protons from the big bag, beta decay. Another is that the bag itself collapses. That is, you start with this big old bag full of protons. It's a dynamical situation. The bag's not just a ball. It's rolling around and, and oscillating. And so you might imagine that one of these big bags sometimes oscillates down and becomes two smaller bags and falls apart. That's what we call fission, and that's another way to reduce the number of protons in a particular piece of nuclear matter. And so that's how protons like to reduce their number once you get elements that are too, have too many of them. So now I've taken through a whole course of nuclear physics, and as you can see, it's really not that bad. <laughs> I didn't show you any of your mathematics. 
So you should be pretty happy about that. And that's one of the things about physics. People, so I'm a theoretical physicist, and my wife is a medical doctor. And people who find out that she uh, is married to a theoretical physicist often ask her, what does your husband really do? <laughs> and so she has a standard answer. She says, oh, he makes up stuff for a living. <laughs> but since it's mathematics, no one can tell him if he's wrong or not. <laughs> That's not quite what I do. Because what theoretical physicists do is actually more akin to what authors do. You know, everybody knows what an author does. An author takes words and punctuation and tells a story. A theoretical physicist is someone who takes mathematics and tells a story. And the stories that we tell about are the ways in which nature works. That's the role of a theoretical physicist. So we're, we're kind of like authors. We're writing these stories. Our stories are mathematical. And then we use them to figure out what's going on in the universe around us. So let me continue in our story. We're going to review something called the standard model, which is basically the recipe book for how to construct a universe as far as we can tell. Uh, first of all, in the standard model, uh, there's our friend the electron. The electron, by the way, is, in fact, the first discovered um, uh, elementary particle. Uh, the ele we actually know who, th uh, who first proposed the existence of the electrons. A man named J.G. Stoney, who was an electrochemist. So looking at you, chemistry folk. Uh, and he was the first person to have the idea that in nature there could be something smaller than an atom. That's a revolutionary idea. Up until that point, people thought atoms were the smallest possible things. And now suddenly this guy comes along and says, no, 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 you can actually have things smaller. And so a chemist actually gave us this idea. Oops, I keep losing control of this thing. Um, but nature is prolific. She also has something that looks like an electron, but it's 200 times as heavy. It's called a mu particle. She also has something that appears at 1,700 times uh, heavy as an electron. It's called a tau particle. These, and then on top of that, she creates neutral versions of the electrons. These neutral versions are called neutrinos. So now we've got the stuff that are parts of an atom. What about the proton and neutron? Well, the proton and neutron are actually collections of these objects, and principally collections of what we call up and down quarks. So if you take three up quarks, I'm sorry, two up quarks and a down quark, you get a proton in a bag. If you take uh, two, one, uh, one up quark and two down quarks, you get a neutron. And so there are also collections of these objects. And then there are the force carriers. Uh, so we have the electromagnetic force. It has a carrier. In fact, you know the name of the carrier, even though if you, you may not know it carries electromagnetic force. It's called the photon. In addition, uh, when you have these bags of quarks, something has to keep them inside the bag. Those, there are actually eight of those objects. They're called gluinos. They're the glue that causes the system to hang together. Uh, there are two forms of, nuclear, of uh, weak nuclear forces, and these actually have to do with that falling apart process that we described earlier. They're, these are the mathematical objects and the physical objects that actually cause those processes to occur. These objects all behave like little spinning uh, basketballs. So if you actually were able to really isolate a quark, one picture you should have in mind is a basketball that spins, and it can either spin in a clockwise or anti-clockwise uh, way, but the rate of spin can neither be sped up nor slowed down. So they're spinning, but you can't speed them up, you can't slow them down. Uh, and in fact, all the elementary particles have this attribute. If we go backwards a little bit, it turns out that the photon spins at twice the rate of the electron. Uh, and these objects here, in fact, everything on this column spins at twice the spin rate of the electron. So they're spinning, and we physicists have a way of measuring that. We have this quantity we call h-bar which you can see in the equation here, and we measure the rates of spin in terms of this number. And here is what I told you earlier, namely that to build up things like protons, you take collections of quarks in a bag, and they give you those forms of nuclear matter. Now, these forms of nuclear matter, the world of the tiny is like our world. It's a dynamic world. It's not static. So in fact, a more accurate represent. so this is one way to think of a proton. You say, aha, I can see the three quarks inside. But in fact, a more accurate view is that it looks something like this. The quarks are bouncing around. The proton is deforming, stretching, contracting. And in this cartoon here, what I've actually tried to do, and I'll, do it, I'll run this by you again, I actually, in this cartoon, decided at some point that I was going to attempt, oops, if I can just get control of this thing. I'm going to try to pull one quark 
out of the side. So you see, there I go. But if you'll notice, instead, the bag actually split into two. And when it split, if you look very carefully, you will see a quark and an anti-quark pair come into creation. So in fact, you can never pull a quark out of nuclear matter. What happens is you stretch it. It's like a rubber band. When you stretch a rubber band, what happens? You dump energy into it. Einstein tells us that energy and mass are the same thing. So at a certain point, when you dump enough energy into the stretching so that it equals the mass of these quark-antiquark -quark pairs, the quark-antiquark -quark pairs pop into existence, the bubbles separate, and you've never got the quark outside of the bubble. That's called infrared slavery, and that's how we think it works in our world. The other thing about our world is we have lots of forces. But, you know, if, I, if Chris came up here and I wanted to put a force on him, I'd probably just shove him and watch him fall over, right? I wouldn't put, I wouldn't put the same kind of force on this Chris. I would probably bow down and say hello. Um, but, you know, in our world, we're used to thinking about forces as pushing and pushing or pulling things. But at the world of, in the world of elementary particles, they don't have arms. So they can't push or pull to exert forces. They have to do something else. And that something else consists of the exchange of the force carriers. So in this cartoon, which will advance, we're gonna have a, an electron here. It's gonna exchange a photon, which carries a message to the second electron. I'm here, you need to get away from me, because like charges repel. That's how like charges repel, by communicating this message with a force carrier, the photon. However, the picture I just showed you, due to a, a physicist named Richard Feynman, I know how to convert into a piece of mathematics. And when I write the mathematical expression from that picture, it says that the force between two charged particles goes like the inverse square of the distance sign, the product of the charges. But that's what you learn in high school about how the electromagnetic repulsion works. So Feynman is a, gave us a graphical way to understand the uh, repulsion between two electrons. However, that's a classical picture. It's a picture where there's no quantum mechanics. We live in a universe that is full of quantum mechanics. And so in a quantum mechanical universe, there's another story I can tell. Remember, physics is about telling stories. In a quantum mechanical universe, I'm going to tell the story a slightly different way. Again, I have two electrons. One is going to tell the other one, get away from me, I'm here. I'm a charged particle, you have the same charge, move away. But in this picture, what we have is the first electron emits a particle of light, which it later reabsorbs, because if it can emit light, it can also absorb light particles. In fact, that was what Einstein kind of discovered in 1905 in what we call the photoelectric effect. And so after it emits this first photon, it emits a second photon, which is the message carrier to the extra other electron saying, get away from me. Now, Mr. Feynman, who taught us how to turn these pictures into mathematical equations, also taught us from this one how to calculate the force law. And guess what? It's not the thing we teach our students in high school. The force law that comes from this picture is not just dependent on the square of the distance on the product of the charges. It depends on other things like the velocities at which things are moving, the spin of the particles. And so in fact, the electromagnetic repulsion between electrons is actually much, much more complicated than we let on when we teach our students. And this brings me to something about physicists. I like to say physicists, we will bend the truth. But we bend the truth in the service of the truth. I mean, if we had to teach high school students about all of this stuff, almost none of them would ever take the time to learn it. Whereas you give them a nice formula, the force that goes like the product of the charge is divided by the square distance. That's algebra. They can remember that, right? And so in physics, we're getting more and more accurate pictures about the way the universe constantly works. Here's another picture. And then this one is rather interesting. That, by the way, the one I just showed you is what's called vertex, uh, vertex renormalization. In this picture here, what we're looking at what's, is what's called vacuum polarization. So let me tell this story. Again, our electron friend moves along, decides to emit a photon. It does so here. That photon moves until it gets to that location. A photon is an uh, energy carrier. Einstein says energy and mass are the same thing. That means that you can replace the amount of energy by equivalent mass. So at this point, the photon disappears, converting itself into an electron and the antiparticle to the electron. That is, in nature, there's something that has exactly the same mass as the electron, but it has the opposite charge. And this thing, if you bring it together with an electron, will disappear in a puff of energy. I don't know if any of you are Star Trek fans from the original Star Trek, but this is one episode where Captain Kirk is uh, haunted by an anti-Captain Kirk who wants to meet him. 
because the anti-Captain Kirk wants to meet Captain Kirk and thereby, when they get together, destroy both universes. And so that's the whole plot of a, a Star Trek episode. Maybe I see at least one gentleman's head moving up and down, so maybe he saw that episode. Um, but in our story, uh, the two, the electron and positron, they have opposite charges. And now you remember how your electrical forces work. Opposite charges attract. So these two things attract each other, getting together. And since they're particle and antiparticle, they disappear. They create a new photon. This second photon is the one that carries the message, you got to get away from me. And this, is called, uh, this one is called uh, va uh, vacuum polarization. And these are measurable effects. It's not just I'm showing you a bunch of mathematics. These are things that people like me and some of your colleagues here, like Dr. Narain and Dr. Atayana, who I don't see in the audience, you have folks in the audience who actually measure this stuff. People who work at accelerators are the people who measure these kinds of effects. And how do we, so when we do these measurements, how confident are we that we have an accurate description of nature? Well, one of these kinds of processes, uh, a set of these processes, imply that the electron acts like a little magnet. And so, um, you can ask how strong a magnet is it? And, and so this is an experiment called the G minus two experiment. People have been testing this over and over again for the last 40 or 50 years. And when you do the test in the laboratory, you find out that the strength of the magnet goes like this number, 2.00231930038. That's what you measure in the laboratory as of maybe three or four years ago. Because the experiment's always updated. Now you do this picture making that I showed you, and it takes hundreds of pictures to get to this level of accuracy. But we have modern computers, and so we can do this. And when you do the calculations using mathematics and these pictures, you find out the strength of this magnetic property is 2.00231930044. Now, you'll notice that the last two digits here are not the same. And so you say, aha, those theoretical physicists don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> they didn't get the number we measure in the laboratory. The only problem with that argument is what sits here in the middle. You see, scientists are never certain about, at least my kind of scientists, we're never certain about anything. And that's one, that's one of the mistakes that people have about science is that science gives us certainty. No, it doesn't. In fact, in science, it is impossible to be certain. And the reason is because in order to make the measurements, you have to have perfect devices. There are no such things as perfect devices. You also have to have perfect experimenters. There are no such thing as perfect experimenters. And so you have to then say, well, gee, how much could I be wrong? And scientifically, we gather this notion in what we call the uncertainty. When you ask a scientist a question and it has an answer, the, if, it's a, if the person is a good scientist, they will tell you two things. They will tell you the best measurement they perform but then they will tell you about the uncertainty in the measurement. If they don't give you these two numbers, it's not good science. That's the way science works. And so when we hear popular debates about, oh, things like, well, it's only a theory. All of physics is a theory. It's a theory of electromagnetism. It's Newtonian theory. It's all a theory. And we physicists say theory for two reasons. First of all, because... At the future, someone may do a better measurement that gets a different answer for what we know, in which case we're going to have to change our equations. So all of our understanding is conditional. And the other reason is because we physicists have learned that the universe has all kinds of surprises for us. So when you ask me as a physicist, how does the universe work, I will give you an answer. Maybe 150 years from now, I'd give you a different answer. That's the way it works. We will change our opinions at the drop of a fact. <laughs> So now, let's move ahead to the Higgs boson. You probably have heard about the Higgs boson. It was discovered at the Large Hadron Collider in, at the LHC. So why, did, why were people looking for the Higgs boson? And as Chris was kind enough to mention in the introduction, there's a NOVA series called The Big Bang Machine that uh, was broadcast in January. So if you want to see the entire story, you can actually go online to YouTube and just put in Big Bang Machine. You can see the entire story there. But we're going to do an abbreviated version. So. Oh boy, here's that math stuff, folks. Bring out the holy water. <laughs> it turns out that the way, as I said, the way we tell our stories is it's written in mathematics. This was something that was emphasized uh, first by Galileo. Galileo made this very wonderful statement that if you want to understand the universe, you've got to actually learn mathematics. And there is no other 
apparent human language that allows us to do this. This surprises people. A lot of people, when they talk to science, they say, oh, can't you do it without the math? Well, I can do it without the math, but I'm going to be shading the truth at some degree. I have to do a simile, a metaphor. I cannot tell you the most precise truth or accuracy if you tell me don't use the mathematics. And as I said, this surprises people because most people are used to thinking in terms of words, and they think that words somehow define precision. But it's easy to convince yourself that's not true. I want each of you to close your eyes and think of the color red. Okay, so your time is up. Open your eyes. Um, so, uh, was the red you thought about fire engine red? Was it the red that you see when the sun is setting in the, after, in the evening? Was it a pale pinkish red? What red were you thinking about? You see, the word red does not give a precise meaning to what it is you claim you're trying to convey. But as a physicist, I can tell you there's a frequency of light that corresponds to red, and it's a number, just like the numbers here. And so as we physicists communicate with, the other, with each other, we're removing the uncertainty that is inherent in human language. So that's why language is insufficient to do science. So we do use math. I showed you these equations. These were first written by James Clark Maxwell in the 1840s first. And these equations I often refer to as the cell phone beeper equations because, you see, this is where your Wi-Fi came from. Because it turns out that this is the first inkling that it would be possible to construct something like an electromagnetic signal, which is the basis of Wi-Fi. Notice the date, 1840. Now, there were no Wi-Fi devices in 1850, 1860, 1870, 1900. 1950, there were not wireless devices of the type that we're conveniently addressed with. And so this tells you the scale at which this science works. It can produce amazingly important results because I bet not a single one of you would be willing to give up your smartphone or your tablet or your computer. Not a single one of you would be willing to do that. But if you didn't have this ability to communicate with electromagnetic waves, which starts with these four equations, think of how different the world would be. So that's, it's on the order of centuries that you get a return on investment. It's not 10 years, it's not 60 years. It's on the order of centuries. If you're lucky, you might get a return in something short, about half that time. For example, Einstein, as I referred to earlier, in 1916 wrote his theory of gravitation that we call general relativity. So uh, that was done in 1916. It's now uh, 2015. I bet a lot of you drive around with navigation devices in your car, so based on GPS. It turns out in order to get GPS to work, you actually have to use the equations of Einstein. So there you have a re an investment that came back in like 90 years. But that's the time scale you need to be thinking about in terms of what theoretical physics does for our species. So it's equations. Ugh, equations. But the story that these equations told us was remarkable. As like I said, it's the birth of the idea that if you take a charged particle and move it, it generates waves that move off, away from where the charged particle is. Those are the basis of your Wi-Fi signals. But no one knew this before the equations were written. This is the power that mathematics demonstrates in theoretical physics. Uh, once you know about the mathematical description, you can even do weird things. Chris talked about uh, how I see things a little bit differently. So this is a story I actually found uh, by looking at some of the mathematics of, of light waves that you can also think of, it, think of it as a game of hopscotch played by a series of rings and arrows. Now, I can actually show you the mathematical formulas. I've never seen them in a book, but I can show you the mathematical formulas that tell me that this is another way for me to think about um, electromagnetic radiation fact. That's Maxwell's equations, and the things I showed you are a solution. Now remember, our goal was we want to understand how protons, when there are too many of them, why do they fall apart? How does that law work? And it turns out that by the 1950s, when we saw that curve turning over, we could fit that pretty well if we took Maxwell's equations and modified them. And the modification is to change them so that they look like this. This is the original Maxwell equation. 
This is the modification. This is the original Maxwell equation. This is the modification. The modification was needed to explain why that curve turns over precisely as it does. Without the modification, you cannot explain that behavior. However, as soon as you make this modification, these equations become mathematically inconsistent, and you can derive the fact that the number one equals two by using these equations once you modify them. There's a little problem with that. <laughs> one doesn't really equal two. And so by the end of the 50s, physics was caught in this conundrum. On the one hand, to explain the turning over, you wanted to modify equations. But if you modify the equations, you could prove one is equal to two. So how do you get out of this quandary? And that's why we began looking for the Higgs boson, quite frankly. So here, here are the gentlemen who figured it all out. And it took about 40 years of work by lots and lots of people to get it all right. Uh, over here, we see uh, Sir Peter Higgs in 2009. But the work was actually done by a series of people, starting with a guy named Anderson, Braut, Anglier, Geralnik, Hagen, Higgs, Kibble, and Tuft. Uh, in other words, the Abegif strike back. <laughs> These are the people who actually started the hunt for the Higgs. And it starts again as a piece of mathematics. So how does it work? Well, it's a little bit complicated. So I'm going to take you a little bit through the mathematics. You write equations that look like this. That's all we need to know. Well, not quite. It turns out that if you want to uh, turn this curve over in a mathematically consistent way, this is the only way we know how to do it, is by starting with this as a starting point. This has several parts. It has something called the vacuum value. And it will turn out that this gives thing, mass to things like protons and quarks and everything that is not a force carrier. It gets its mass from this part of this mathematical expression. There's also the Higgs boson itself, which was measured first, uh, announced in 2012. And in, uh, it was an, announced actually on July 4th. So I like to say that the Higgs boson was born on the 4th of July. <laughs> and then there's another part of the Higgs part of this mathematical trick that we have to use, which is this object here. It's called a Goldstone boson. And now this, it's this Goldstone boson that actually does the modification to the Maxwell equation in such a way that you can no longer prove that 1 is equal to 2. So it's a fairly complicated process, but the goals are pretty easy to understand what was trying to be done. And now this was a piece of math, and this is what Peter Higgs actually had in his first paper around 1967. He submitted the paper. It was rejected the first time. That often happens in physics, that papers that contain good ideas go to referees. And if you're a, this is, oh, gee, how do I say this? If you're a, a scientist, perhaps you're not the biggest fan of referees when you submit your papers, because all of us who are scientists know what it's like to deal with a referee. Typically, you're sending your paper to someone who knows less about what you did than you do, but they have the, let's call it insight, to tell you that you're wrong. This happens quite commonly in physics. Ask any of my colleagues. They can tell you tons of stories about this. Is that not right, Dr. Narang? Right? All of us have experiences. This is how it works in the business. So, Higgs' paper was rejected the first time. And the, and, but the reason was rather interesting. They said, OK, so this, you got all this math about turning the curve over, blah, 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 blah. What prediction does it make? And he went back and he thought about it. And he said, and he realized that this object here in his math formula was something that you ought to be able to see in an experiment. This is the Higgs boson. And so that's why, this, that's why the hunt got started. Now, let me tell you the story without the math, because it's much simpler to understand. What the story says is that when you write that quantity I showed you, it's like sitting at the top of a very smooth hill. And in particular, when you're at the top of the hill, what you have is a little ball that represents both the, that entire mathematical expression I showed you, the vacuum value, the Higgs field, and this mysterious thing called the Goldstone boson. They're all represented by this ball. But it's at the top of an extremely smooth hill. If you put a ball on the top of an extremely smooth hill, what do you expect will happen? You roll down, right? Because it'd be almost impossible to get it exactly to sit there. This is what we call, it would be, uh, this is uh, unstable stability if you try to get it to balance there. It would roll down the side. And so what happens is that it rolls down the side. That's what all that math was just trying to describe. And when it rolls down, a couple of things happen. First of all, 
it goes from being in the center of this curve to out being on the side. But because it interacts with other things like what we call the W's boson and the Z boson, they gain mass from the goldstone part of the expression. The photon, it turns out, is unaffected by this. And so the particle of light does not become massive. But the weak force carriers gain mass by this mechanism. And this is what we call spontaneous symmetry breaking. So as you can see, it's a story. When you look at the mathematics, it looks like that. And you say, oh my god, what are they talking about? But when you tell it as a story, even an elementary school student can understand this. Now, I told you that other particles get mass too. The thing I call the vacuum value, it's like a kind of glue that fills up all of space, uh, like a uh, syrup. And so when things move through it, you would expect if you were moving through syrup, the viscosity would make it harder to move. The vacuum value acts like that with regard to particles. And so if you try to move through it, you have this kind of surpiness around the particle, and that's why things like electrons appear to have mass. So this mathematical construction does two things. It gives mass to the weak force carriers. It leaves the photon untouched, and it also gives mass to electrons and muons and top particles and quarks. But it does it by two very different uh, responses. So how do we know this is all accurate? Well, you got to go to CERN. And some of my colleagues here go to CERN. And if you flew over CERN at about 30,000 feet, you would see this. There's Lake Geneva. There are the Alps. Well, you wouldn't see this red circle. <laughs> That's only superimposed on the picture to show you where the LHC is located. It's actually underground, so you can't see it from the air. So you actually have to go down underground in tunnels. And there are, two, and there are a number of experiments there, but uh, two, the principal two ones are the CMS detector and the Atlas detectors. These are the detectors that actually discovered the Higgs boson. Now, I have to tell you that this, this LHC ring, which is underground, which is about to go back into scientific operation because it's actually been upgraded for the last year or so, this ring can, consists of a big pipe that is basically evacuated, and you use superconducting magnets to bend the protons around in a circular path. Now, What's often not known is that this technology mostly began in the United States. Back in the 90s, there was an attempt to build a similar device called the superconducting supercollider, which, if it had been built, would have been three times more energetic than the LHC when it began operation. It would have been completed a decade earlier, and we would have found the Higgs particle a decade earlier in a place called Watsahatchee, Texas. But we Americans decided to our Congress that we were not going to build it. At the time, people said, oh, it was due to cost overruns. But if you actually look back at the figures, the cost overruns amount to maybe three to five B-2 bombers. We could have easily afforded to build the SSC, but we simply as a nation chose not to. So, but the technology that we designed for the SSC largely went to the LHC. And I remember when I first heard about this, because in 1998, I was in the White House with President Clinton. And um, we were on a receiving line, my wife and I. And the president said, you know, well, he knew I was a physicist. Well, why was I in the White House? Well, Stephen Hawking was giving a talk. Uh, uh, first Lady Clinton had a series she called the Millennium Lecture Series. And at the end of the talk, they wanted to have a Q&A. But as that picture uh, that Chris showed of, of Stephen back in actually 1980. By the time 1998 had come around, his condition was considerably worse. And he was not able to speak at all. So Stephen uses an electronic device to speak. So now, imagine how this goes. So he gives a speech, which is actually pressing a button and letting the voice synthesizer make the presentation. Everyone claps at the end. You know, Stephen's given a great speech. And then they want to have a Q&A. Not going to work with Stephen. So what they did is invite a few of us scientists to come into the White House, and we handled the Q&A for Stephen. And so that's how I actually got a chance to meet uh, President Clinton. So he knew I was a physicist because I had answered some of the questions. So when we got up to him, he said, you know, we were sorry that we lost the SSC. And he gave a song and dance about why that's true. Offline, I'll tell you what I think about that. Um, 
But then the second thing he said, but you'll be happy to know that the United States has committed itself to spending a minimum of $500 million to do the technology at the LHC in Europe. And so at that point, I knew that though the SSC was not going to be completed, that this science would continue to advance, but it would occur at the LHC um, in England, uh, in uh, Switzerland and France. So the LHC is a place for producing these Higgs particles. It, the Large Hadron Collider is what we call a PP synchrotron, which means that PP stands for protons. We make protons, take protons, we make them move initially at an energy of 7 TeV per beam. That's a way that we physicists like to measure energy. Uh, it's a 27, um, uh, circumference, 27 kilometer circumference uh, machine between a depth of 50 and 150 meters below ground. So it might, might sound like it's tilted. But in fact, the LHC is level. It's the ground that tilts because it tilts towards the outs, right? So it's the ground that tilted. It's not the machine that's tilted. Yes, that was good. So if you went inside the tunnel, you'd see something like this. It looks like a big oil pipe, right? I mean, this looks like the kind of thing you would transport petroleum products along. So this is inside the tunnel looking one way, looking another. And if you took the oil pipe apart, that's where you can see American technology. Because inside the pipe, first of all, there are actually two beams. They counter-circulate. One goes clockwise, the other counterclockwise. Uh, there are devices for eliminating, uh, it's a high vacuum environment. So essentially, you want to pump the air molecules out of the beam pipes for the very simple reason that you don't want the protons bumping into them and thereby losing the energy. Remember, the goal is to take the energy of the protons and create a massive object. So this is what the technology looks like. They're super uh, cooled. They're cryostatic. I mean, it's a marvelous piece of technology. If you look at this YouTube video called The Big Bang Machine, you can learn all about this. And this is how it works. So protons, which basically start off with, uh, uh, in a pre-injection device, which we see here. And they're sped up to greater and greater velocities until by the end they are, they are released into the main beam line. They're traveling at 0.999999, the speed of light. They're traveling faster than anything we humans have ever made travel before. And here's another illustration. We can go into the main beam pipe with one of these beams. And it looks sort of like this. This is the evacuated pipe. Now, in this cartoon, and it's only a cartoon, you only see like four or five protons rushing by us. But in the real world, Enormous numbers, 10 to the 16, 17 protons are all rushing by us as the beam goes. And then we allow them to collide at places like this. This is a cartoon of the CMS detector. And the way to think about the CMS detector is that it's actually a big iPhone used to take pictures. Because the particles can't take selfies themselves. You know, they can't do selfies. <laughs> So we have to provide for their pictures, and that's what these devices actually do. And from these pictures, we begin to understand the structure, and that's how we found the Higgs particle. Uh, there are some pictures of this. This is a Feynman graph. Something called gluon fusion occurs, where you take the two protons, you collide them together, and then out of the energy of them, they actually couple to a particle we call the top quark, which then creates the Higgs boson. Now, we don't actually see this stuff. In fact, we don't see this stuff either. What we actually look for is these uh, photons that come out at the end of the process. Those are detectable. And then some of them actually can decay because there's actually another more predominant mode where you look at what's called the four lepton decay mode channels. And that's how we see the Higgs boson. We use this reconstruction to figure out whether the Higgs boson is there. And we have found it. So to. Uh, Move on. Uh, these are cartoons of the CMS. And this may not be impressive, except that this is the scale, and that's a person. So for people who do not understand the scale of these devices, this is a very uh, accurate uh, drawing. Here's the real device. This is uh, while the ma machine was being constructed. You can see a technician here in his white lab coat inside the machine. Here's the Atlas detector. The Atlas is my favorite detector, because its name stands for a toroidal LHC apparatus. <laughs> As you can see, somebody was really reaching for that acronym. <laughs> but that's literally what it stands for. 
That's what the Atlas detectors are about. And again, this is the scale. You can see pe people in this cartoon, and that's the device. Both of these devices exist and are in operation. <coughs> if you saw the movie uh, Angels and Demons, there's a scene where they go to this big scientific facility, you see this huge device. The producers of that film actually went to the LHC, and they were shocked because they didn't know real science produced such things. And then they modeled what they had in the movie after this. And again, uh, the picture while the Atlas detector is being put, uh, put together, here we have a technician in uh, a brown jacket, a yellow hard hat, brown pants, and that's the device around him. That's what this kind of science needs. So I was born on the 4th of July. Before the 4th of July, 2012, if you ask what's, what is there in the universe, people like me would have told you this table. But afterwards, we added the Higgs boson. So now we have to add the Higgs boson. So there it is. Now, the Higgs boson is very special in many ways. All the other particles I told you are like little spinning basketballs. The Higgs particle doesn't spin at all. It's the first time our species has ever found an elementary particle that doesn't spin. It's a spinless boson. Spin equals zero. Uh, how do we know this? Well, because of the W particles, we can actually look at the, we use mathematics to reconstruct the Ws, and so we're certain that the Higgs boson has no spin from that reconstruction. This is part of my Higgs, uh, my theorist bucket list. You see, I'm a theorist, and so, you know, I'm, not, I'm 64 years old, I'm not going to be around forever, but there's some things in science I would like to know. And so with the discovery of the Higgs boson, that was the first big thing on my list. I wanted to see whether the Higgs boson was out there. Well, yeah, we know it's there now. Uh, gravity waves, well, gee, what are those? Well, it turns out gravity, you remember our picture of the photon with the little green signals, the little waves going out when we move a charged particle? It turns out gravity does the same thing. If you take an object that has a gravitational force and you sh move a big enough object back and forth, you generate waves of gravity. Those have never been seen in the laboratory. And so there's an entirely different set of experiments called LIGO, the Laser Interferometry Gravitational Wave Observatory, which is designed precisely to detect these waves in our universe. Superpartners, well, we're going to come to those in a little while, but that's really related to my own research. And then there's this thing called string, super string M theory or string theory. That's probably not going to happen in my lifetime. It might happen on a TV show like the Big Bang Theory, maybe. <laughs> but it's probably not gonna happen in real life. String theory is probably very, very far removed from any kind of experimental confirmation. However, now we come to the scary part of the talk. The title of this talk is, uh, what, do, what guards our reality against oblivion? And now let me get to it, because we're now, we got all the pieces of the science to tell the story. So we know that there's a Higgs particle. And we have found it in the laboratory. It's about a, it's about a 126 or 25 GeV, so, so like sort of like that. Among the quarks, there's a heaviest quark. It's called the top quark. And it turns out that when you use the mathematics that describes these things, you find that if the top quark is too heavy, that that whole Higgs story that I told you doesn't occur. And if the Higgs story doesn't occur, nothing gets mass. If nothing gets mass, you cannot form atoms. And if you can't form atoms, you can't do chemistry, you can't get stars, you can't get our universe. And so the fact that the top quark is this incredibly heavy object has raised the debate in the physics community of whether through quantum fluctuations you undo the Higgs story that we told you earlier. And this is a serious debate. It's been going on for a, a couple of years now. So are we going to suddenly just disappear? Because that's what the title of this talk is about. Will the universe just suddenly vanish because of the instability. What, why would the instability occur? Well, you know, if you flipped a coin, I bet you would expect heads or tails. But there's another outcome that's possible. 
right? It, it, theoretically, it's possible that when you flip a coin, it will land on its edge and stay there. Now, it's very improbable, but it's not impossible. And so when you talk about instabilities, like being on the edge when that previous chart where I showed you, it's like we're almost sitting here as a universe. And if we should fall down, that would be the undoing of the Higgs story. Why should it fall down? Well, in the world of the small, quantum fluctuations are always occurring. It's, it's almost like the surface of a boiling sea. There's a lot of uh, just random motion. And so if you actually set a configuration, the fluctuations might undo the situation that you set up. And so that's a real danger. What could mitigate against that? Well, the ground state, which is what we, uh, we were talking about, uh, in our universe where the top quark isn't too heavy, Oops. In the universe where the top quark is not too heavy, it kind of works like this. You can imagine a cup where you pour some water in. And as long as the sides of the cup are up, then you know where all the water is going to be. It's going to be down at the bottom, and that's a stable configuration. But suppose you deform the cup so that it looks like this. Then you can pour water in here, but if you start to jiggle this, and those are what the quantum fluctuations do, they jiggle the cup. Then you could imagine that if you jiggle it too hard, some of this water falls down here. And that's the configuration where you undo the Higgs story. And so it is theoretically possible when we worry about this occurring. And so what could stop it? Well, remember the culprit in our story is the fluctuations. That's what caused the danger. And so if there was a way to get rid of the fluctuations, you would have, to, you would have one less worry about the stability of the universe. When Mendeleev first presented his uh, table of elements, it actually looks like this. It looked like this. You notice there are holes in this? And um, I actually, um, uh, so one of my colleagues at the University of Maryland is uh, Sergey Brin's father. Actually, his father's a mathematician. And he's uh, spent uh, uh, an entire career at the University of Maryland. And I actually know Misha Brin. I wish I knew Sergey, of course, but that's a whole other issue. Um, but I know Misha, and one day Misha was talking about this table, and he, he said, you know, Jim, after Mendeleev uh, created this table, the czar gave him a medal. Right, that was my reaction. I'm like, the czar was so forward-looking that he would give a medal to someone who made the first table of elements? And Misha said, no, 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 Jim. <laughs> the medal was given for vodka. Because you see, Mendeleev also figured out how to more efficiently produce vodka. And that's what the medal was for. Now, this table, as you can see, has holes. It's not very pretty to look at. The modern table of elements looks like this. It's a much more symmetrical object. And so this idea of symmetry turns out to be incredibly important. And so let me tell you about our universe one more time. If you look at our universe right now, this is what we know. Here the, here are the ele electron and its friends, collectively called these leptons. Here are the quarks and uh, its friends, we call, we call them quarks. This is how you get atoms, basically, from these things. These are the force carriers. The photon, carrier of electromagnetic force. The Z and W particles, they carry the nu weak nuclear force. There are eight gluons that carry the strong uh, QCD force. And the Higgs boson, which is a kind of force carrier. That's what the universe looks like right now, according to our best science. And now I ask you to look at that picture, and I have a very simple question for you. Is that a pretty picture? <laughs> Probably not, unless you're a really warped person. <laughs> it's not very symmetrical. In fact, it reminds me of that first version of the Mendeleev table. And so the universe would be far more symmetrical if it looked like that. Right? And you can see a nice left-right balance. Now, it's not up and down symmetrical, but it's far more symmetrical than the thing that I showed you. So this is what supersymmetry is about. Supersymmetry suggests the idea that there are more of these tiny particles than we've ever seen in the laboratory, and they appear in such a way to enhance the symmetry of the standard model. And in fact, uh, this is why I started doing this research in 1975 or 76, it was because the first time I saw the equations, and I understood almost immediately that if these equations were true, we live in a more symmetrical universe. Now, one of the things that 
about the discovery of supersymmetry in the, in the early days when I first began looking at it is that we also learned something about supersymmetry is the only piece of mathematics that we have ever discovered that suppresses quantum fluctuations. And remember, that's what we want for our stability. We want to get rid of quantum fluctuations. And so that's why we, we may live in a universe, and we don't know this because we haven't seen the superpartners, but we may live in a universe that's stable because it knows that it has to have this bigger symmetry that rules out quantum fluctuations that keeps us in that nice picture of the cup where all the water's at the bottom and there's no lower place to go to. So in the super universe, there's lots more stuff. Um, we have neutrinos in our universe, electron neutrino. Well, there will be electron neutrino in a supersymmetric universe. Uh, in our universe, we have electrons. In a supersymmetric universe, there will be selectrons. In our universe, we have muons. There will be some muons in a supersymmetric universe. In our universe, we have up and up quarks. Well, in a supersymmetric universe, you have up quarks. In our universe, you have down quarks. In a supersymmetric universe, you have down quarks. Charm, quarks and quarks, strange quarks and quarks, top and bottom. And this occurs also for the force carriers. In our universe, we have our familiar friend, the photon. In a supersymmetrical universe, there would have to be something called a photino. The photon spins at twice the rate of the electron. The photino spins at exactly the same rate of the electron. Um, among the force carriers, in our universe, there's a W that was responsible for the turning of the curve in the right way and having mass, the thing that said modify Maxwell's equation. In a supersymmetrical universe, you have to have a charged, well, this is my favorite superpartner of all time. <laughs> you see, its name is spelled W-I-N-O. And I would love to be alive one day and see a paper with a big headline, W-I-N-O seen in Geneva. Now, if you don't know science, you would think that this is referring to some kind of alcoholic specialist. But if you knew about supersymmetry, you would understand that it's an elementary particle of a very particular type that had been seen. So these superpartners actually could do something else interesting for us because our cosmologi cosmologi cosmological friends tell us that all the science that we've studied for the last several hundred years um, oops, amounts to this. We probably know something about 4% of what's in the universe after several hundred or if not thousand years of science. There's good evidence that there's lots of stuff in the universe. We have no idea what it is. We, compose, we break it up into two pieces. There's dark matter, and it turns out that these extra super partners that I showed you, they, at least one of them, looks like it, it's an excellent candidate to be this extra stuff that our cosmologist friends tell us have to be there to understand the large scale structure of the universe. And then the other part, which is truly mysterious, is dark energy. And nobody I know has any good ideas of explaining this stuff. But we've got lots of evidence it's actually there. In October, I was asked to write an article in advance of the, uh, re, uh, the re, um, ignition of the LHC. And I wrote it, and it's published, it's called Sticking with Susie. It's published in a British journal called Physics World. And in the article, I talked about this hunt for Susie. Now, in 2006, I actually warned my, there, in 2006 and seven, that period, there were many people in my community said, as soon as the LHC turns on, we're gonna see these super partners. I wrote an article for Physics Today in 2006, or 2008 or so, I can't remember, where I said, nah, folks, don't believe the hype. It's, in my opinion, I, I thought it extremely unlikely that we would see super partners with the first turn on. And I was one of the few people that wrote such things, and, but of course, I'm a theorist, so nobody has to pay attention to a theorist. And like uh, Cassandra in the uh, Greek mythology, I turned out to be right, but nobody listened, that's okay. So now the LHC is being turned back on. And so the editors of this journal, having known that I wrote this first article that said, where I said I'm pessimistic, they said, well, what do you think now? And so in this article, I wrote again what I think about this uh, upcoming scientific run. And I'm still pessimistic, by the way. I said I wouldn't bet my farm on the discovery of supersymmetry. 
And now it sounds like I don't believe supersymmetry is there at all, but that's not true. I think at the end of the day, we're going to find supersymmetry in nature. And the reason I think the most power, for me, the most powerful reason for that is the fact that it's the only piece of mathematics we know that can calm this quantum fluctuation business. I think that's profound, that you have a piece of mathematics that says quantum fluctuations can be tamed if you use such a system. That's, my, that's ultimately why I'm confident supersymmetry is going to be found in nature. Now, I have to do a series of acknowledgments, but I'm happy to start to take questions. Uh, there are a lot of people I have to thank. So I, I was actually talking to some of the experimentalists as I was thinking about preparing this talk. And so I've actually, at one version or another, I'm deeply indebted to uh, Madhya uh, Valesco uh, for the work that she has done. Um, so a lot of the imagery in this is actually in a commercial product that I don't own, but I can use to show. It's a commercial product by a company called uh, The Teaching Company. This is the product. Uh, I also have to acknowledge a gentleman by the name of Kenneth Griggs who, although the cartoons that I showed you were actually pictures that came out of my head, I'm not smart enough to know how to do computer graphics, so I actually have to work with people who, who are. Uh, and then, of course, there's uh, on fusion and, and Becquerel's discovery of radiation, natural radioactivity, as well as my McKee Curie, which I refer to in some of my images. You can go to YouTube and actually find that, and that's it. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. All right, so questions. Oh, no, no, yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, so I get to ask, I get to point, um, because Jim doesn't want to be a bad guy. So, questions? Come on, physicist. Give me a question. No, I think, I think they've all become experts. Uh, on top. On top. Some of these deep flows of uh, high energy physics can also be found at low energies in real, real, real phenomena, uh, like the Higgs can be found in superconductivity. Ah, uh, yes. Supersymmetry. Super yeah. Sure. So let me repeat your question for the audience so everyone can hear it. It turns out that. Um, that the Higgs story tell, teaches us something very interesting about the universe we live in. Because, in fact, the first people, I'm, I start this discussion off with a guy named Anderson. Anderson was not thinking about tiny elementary particles. In fact, he was asking questions of, in another part of physics called condensed matter physics. And by the way, that's the physics you should love most because that's where you actually get devices from. It comes from condensed matter physics. And so Antal's question was, so in the case of the Higgs particle, because condensed matter physics was actually where the, Higgs, the whole concept of the Higgs particle could actually first be discovered, could you do something like that for supersymmetry? That's, that's the question, essentially. And in principle, I think the answer is yes. I don't know of any prediction. I, but first of all, I know that there have been people in condensed matter physics that increasingly are using supersymmetry. But I know, of no, I know of no overwhelmingly convincing model that would tell me that, yes, supersymmetry has been seen um, in condensed matter. But there are, there are physicists that disagree with me and say, yeah, we actually have evidence of supersymmetry in condensed matter. Well, this is uh, my suspicions, and I hope I'm wrong, by the way, but my suspicions are that the energies that one will need to find superpartners is far beyond even the upgrade uh, to the LHC. Now, that would not be healthy in many ways because that would discourage entire generations of physicists who are sort of used to finding these things. There are plans to build more powerful machines. There's a plan for building what's called the International Linear Collider, which would be even more powerful than the LHC. There's a discussion of building a super LHC that some people have discussed. And so there are people thinking about building devices beyond the LHC, but it's going to be really, really difficult if we don't see uh, something. And it doesn't have to be supersymmetry, by the way, but 
it was going to be really difficult if we don't see some new physics in the next round of the LHC. Because in a sense, the Higgs boson was expected. We, we expected to find it. We actually found it. And not only did we find it, we actually found it that it is what's sometimes called a plain vanilla Higgs boson, meaning that it has the properties that exactly are predicted by the equation that Peter Higgs and company wrote down. And so that's kind of boring. What would be really interesting is maybe to find another Higgs particle. Because if we found another Higgs, that's one of the signals of supersymmetry. Supersymmetry says there actually have to be a minimum of five Higgs particles, not one. And so if we found something like that, even though it's not directly supersymmetry, it might be an indicator that supersymmetry is out there. So that's kind of what's in the landscape for the future. And then, of course, we need to keep our eyes open for things we haven't thought about, because nature is just infinitely clever. Could you ask a follow-up question now? So how big is the next change? Oh, you can ask the question. doesn't mean I'm going to. So the question that he's putting into this gentleman's mouth is, is what's the mass of the next Higgs? And so my answer is, I don't know. That is a great assumption. I wish, <laughs> I really wish it were true, but keep going. What, what goals would you say are important to keep in mind for science in the U.S. for the next century, say? Next century? Well, let me talk about the things that I think are sort of in the foreground. One of them is the discovery of gravitational waves. Uh, these two facilities in the United States, one in the state of Washington and the other in the state of uh, Louisiana, have actually been functioning for about a decade, but they, they've been in what sometimes is called a demonstration mode, that you want to demonstrate that the technology works. But it's now starting to be time where the sensitivities in these devices are starting to be in the range where one expects to get signals of gravity waves. So for me, that next item on my bucket list, I think it's really important that we as a nation make the push to make that discovery. Uh, and like I said, but that's sort of in the immediate foreground. Um, the biggest puzzle in physics is dark energy. No one I know has any decent explanation for what dark energy is. That big 73% of the universe, around 73% of the universe, <laughs> that the cosmologists tell us they have evidence for by looking at galaxies and exploding stars, it would, I think it's really, really important for us to figure that out, to try to figure out what is exactly dark energy. Right now, we're like doctors. I don't know if you know how doctors work, but if you ever go to a doctor with uh, some set of symptoms, and um, the doctor looks at you and does an examination and then says, oh, uh, they're idiopathic. And you, think somehow, and you think somehow they've identified a disease. Well, if as some people know the punchline here, when a doctor says that the symptoms are idiopathic, they're saying, we don't know what the hell this is. <laughs> so when we use the words dark energy, we're being like doctors. We've got these words attached to this concept, but we have no idea what this is. So I think that's going to be a really big important uh, part of physics. However, the other, the biggest challenge for physics in the next 100 years, because you set that deadline, not me, the biggest challenge is to m discover a source of clean, sustainable energy. Because we cannot, as a species, continue to do to this planet what we're doing right now in terms of how we generate our energy. So something like fusion is the biggest challenge I know about that goes out to about a century. And hopefully, science is up to doing that one, because otherwise, we as a species may be in very deep trouble. Okay. Yeah. I have a question about going back to Susie and the scale of Susie, yeah. which is, I think is rather high. But the mass of an old is so low that it also says that Susie could be low mass. So how do you reconcile it's so, you're exactly right, uh, technically, because the Higgs is so low, you could say, aha, the, the um, super partner should be relatively low. The only, and you're right that that's a, that statement actually follows within a class of assumptions. But 
I know how to build models that don't obey those assumptions, and in those, the, he, the super particle masses are just ridiculously high. I hope not. I hope that they're not too much more massive. Like I said, I would love to see more Higgses because for people like me, the most natural piece of mathematics we know is that supersymmetry says there gotta be five of them. So if you can just see one more Higgs for me, please call me. <laughs> not really. Sure. So the way that that story goes is as follows. Uh, I told you about my uncle, so let me go back to his picture. So Uncle Albert, in 1916, wrote some equations. And from these equations, we get stories about things like the Big Bang and the beginning of the universe and black holes and all this neat stuff that you hear about in science fiction. It actually all starts as mathematics. And so when he first wrote the equations, what he found was it looks as though the universe had a beginning and then expands. And then after it expands in this first version of the story, it, 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 the conclusion is two. If at the instant of the Big Bang there was more energy and gravity than there was in the matter in the universe, then what you get would be a recollapse eventually. So you get what's called a big crunch. If at the instant of the Big Bang there was more energy uh, in matter than gravity, then the expansion would go on forever. But this expansion would occur at a constant rate. Now, at the time that he first wrote these equations, all the best astrophysicists and cosmologists in the world said, the universe is static and eternal. Now, his equation said, no, you got to get some kind of motion or something going on. And being as bright as uh, many of uh, our undergraduates are at universities like uh, Brown, Einstein was at least as bright as some of these undergraduates. And if you're an undergraduate in a physics lab and you're, doing, uh, and you're actually recording re your results and your results are not agreeing with what the book says it's supposed to be, you learn how to use a very sophisticated piece of mathematics called a fudge factor. <laughs> and you salt it through your lab book in the hopes that your grader doesn't actually notice. And then you will have the re Someone's laughing here. So uh, <laughs> someone here is laughing very hardly. So he or she knows what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> And so that's actually what Einstein did to his first version of the equation. He put this fudge factor into it. Now, we call this fudge factor the cosmological constant. And the reason he put it there was because he wanted the universe to be held stable like a bubble, static and unchanging. Uh, some years later, people like Hubble discovered the universe was expanding. At that point, Einstein went back to his equations, and he erased this fudge factor, and he then called it the biggest blunder of his career. And it may well have been, because if he had not put it there, he would have predicted the expansion of the universe, and he might have actually gotten another Nobel Prize, right? Now, after Einstein erased it for the next 80 years, those of us who study such things have been happy to have his fudge factor set to zero. But about 10 years ago, uh, Adam Rees and Saul per uh, Perlmutter, among others, were looking at the stars, and they noticed something very interesting. We talked about supernovae explosions in my presentation. Well, that's a regular occurrence in the universe. And there, there's a particular kind of supernova that is like a standard clock. And you can use it to measure the expansion of the universe. And what they noticed was that when you actually do that, looking at large sections of the sky, you find out that it looked like some of the supernovae were occurring when there was no universe. But there's something wrong with that picture. And what they figured out is the way that you correct that is you take into account that our universe is expanding, but it's expanding at an accelerating rate. For Einstein, it was a constant rate of expansion. But with um, this observation, it's speeding up. So how do you explain this speed up? But well, the answer, is, the simplest answer, and this is what people basically do, they go back to Einstein's cosmological constant. They reintroduce it into the equation just like he did. He was trying to get a static bubble. In order to get a static bubble, you have to introduce this constant with a negative sign. It's a negative number. 
But if you want to get this expansion, you go back and you put the exact same quantity in his equation, but you put it in with a positive sign. And that positive sign then drives the acceleration of the expansion. And since we have ob uh, observational evidence of the acceleration of the expansion, not only is the universe expanding, it's speeding up in its expansion. That's the important thing to know. It's not just expansion, but accelerating expansion. We, the only explanation we have right now is this fudge factor that we put back in with the other sign, and that's what people call dark energy. But we don't really know if that's what's going on. furthering of basic research, but I'm wondering whether over the years you ferreted out strategies for actually communicating and advocating effectively for, uh, for funding and generally supporting basic research, because there's often such a gap between what scientists understand as being important and what the public views as being important. Well, that was inherent in my telling you the story of Maxwell, because if there had been no basic funding for Maxwell, you wouldn't have an app on your hip right now. And it is true that this is not a story that the public generally understands. And it's not just the public, by the way. Um, in, the la in my lifetime, there has been an amazing shift in terms of business uh, management strategy. And it used to be when I was a child, it was considered good business practice to manage your business in such a way that it, uh, that it existed for decades. This has disappeared in our country. Businesses are no longer managed in, uh, in such a way that the goal is to sustain the existence of the business for decades. It has been replaced by one must maximize the profit in the next quarter. And so this is a big shift in our society. It affects what we do in thinking about science. And so one of the roles of people like you, because you're the next educated young generation, is to understand why this investment is so important. You're not going to feel it 10 years down the road that you didn't do it. You're not going to feel it in 20 years. But on the order of something like, you know, 100 years or so, some of your great, 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 great grandkids will feel the effect of your decision. And that's, in fact, the challenge of speaking to the American public about these issues. I think we're done. No, you don't get off that easy. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a question. Um, the, what you didn't hear about tonight is uh, some new work that Jim is doing that lets mere mortals begin to understand what supersymmetry is about. So could you, you know, that's that's a whole nother hour talk, but can you give me, give us the 30 minute, <laughs> give us the 30 second version. <laughs> I don't have a 30 second version of that story. Two, a, a minute? I can t maybe do it in a minute. Right. So I didn't know you were going to do this, Chris, and I wish you and I wish you hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a second here, and I'm going to hold you to that minute because we're uh, the Turner Pumpkins at seven. I see. Okay. I have technical difficulties. <laughs> so am I off the hook now? No. I didn't think so. OK, so this is a presentation that is actually online also at YouTube. It's my 2013 presentation at, uh, of the Oppenheimer Lecture at Berkeley. So what Chris was agitating for me to do is to tell you about something that, <laughs> that I'm not sure what the word is. Something, something that is crazy. Yeah, that's a good word for it. That's a good technical term for it, it's crazy. So it turns out that, uh, as I said, people like me study equations. But for the last decade, I and a group of my scientific collaborators, both mathematicians and physicists, have been studying equations like what you see on the transparency here. These equations have that property of supersymmetry, that balance I told you about. But it also turns out that we discovered that these kinds of equations 
can be represented in terms of pictures. Just something similar to Feynman graphs. Remember I told you Feynman graphs and we could calculate the one over S squared for, force? We've essentially invented a new kind of Feynman graph that works for supersymmetry. And the thing that is really bizarre, which is the thing that Chris really wants me to tell you. To justify my communication theorist existence is that these objects that we're working on, these graphs, which have a very well-defined mathematical meaning, actually have bits buried in them, strings of ones and zeros. This is the first time I've ever seen a piece of science in my part of physics where digital bits show up in the structure of the equations. Not because you're trying to put the equations on a computer and solve them, because that's the way we scientists normally do. We take equations, we discretize them, we put them on a computer, and then we get approximate answers. In this particular example, the structure of the equations themselves have strings of ones and zeros in them. And they're not just random ones and zeros. They're what are called error correcting codes, which is something that you use every day because it allows your browser to work. And so we, uh, if supersymmetry is ever discovered in the laboratory, then I will be able to say that we made a discovery that says that there are these digital bits that underlie the structure of the, the equations. Now, that's so bizarre that uh, I didn't do this work alone. I had uh, collaborators, as I mentioned. In fact, I formed an interdisciplinary group of mathematicians and physicists, and that's how we uncovered this. But this is so bizarre that, um, well, once I made a joke that goes, uh, I don't know how many of you saw the Matrix uh, science fiction movie, but if you saw the Matrix science fiction movie, imagine that there are physicists in that movie. How could they figure out that they were in the science fiction movie? One way might be to look for evidence of digital codes and the laws of their physics, but that's what I just told you. And I'll let you off the hook. Thank you. All right, thank you.